Well, greetings out there on YouTube land and welcome to today's stellar video, which promises to be one of the most significant we have ever posted. Much has been speculated about the effect of output tube bias on tone, amplitude gain, and the onset of distortion. We're told that an optimum PD for grid biased output tubes is 70% of the max PD for the tubes being used. We're also told that hotter bias results in either more or less headroom and more or less gain uh, depending on who you're listening to. What I propose to do is to use this fully reconditioned Silverface Deluxe Reverb with an AB763 circuit to determine the truth about the effect of tube bias on tone gain and the onset of distortion. Granted, the results will apply primarily to this specific amp with its set of well-matched 6v6s, but I feel confident that what we discover will also apply to virtually all grid-biased amps. Here is how I intend to proceed. Using the adjustable bias control in this circuit and a single digitally recorded input I will record the output from its new Jensen C12N speaker at four different bias settings. And they will be 40, 50, 60, and 70 percent of maximum plate dissipation. We'll then listen to the digital recordings to subjectively evaluate tone. This is purely a subjective analysis and thus while being the most important of the criteria being evaluated it is scientifically the weakest, but, but it will allow for personal preference in how you put the results into practice. You can choose the bias that you feel yields the best tone. Second, we will examine the output signals with an audio editing program to visualize changes in amplitude, if any, associated with each bias percentage. Finally, we will analyze the signal output at four different bias levels with an oscilloscope to determine the exact voltage or volume level at which distortion begins. If this sounds interesting, and I hope it does, then let's get started. Step one uh, involves removal of all the cables and connections from the chassis of the uh, Deluxe Reverb and then we will remove the chassis, set it in a chassis stand, uh, reconnect the speaker, and uh, then we'll have access to the bias adjustment pot, and we can input our digital recording and record the output from the Jensen C12N speaker. All right, here's the chassis out on the stand. You can see it's a really nice, clean uh, example. Uh, this is my own personal amp. I've had this for years. Um, I rebuilt it uh, to the best of my ability, so we should be getting some good tone out of it. Um, we have a really nice match set of RCA 6V6s in place and a brand new JJ uh, GZ34. As usual, I have connected the uh, Eurotubes bias probes in series with the 6V6s so that we can uh, get a real accurate plate uh, voltage and plate current readings and calculate plate dissipation uh, from our output tubes. Using an extension cord I plugged in here to the cabinet speaker jack of the uh, amplifier circuit and I've run that over and connected it to the C12N Jensen speaker in the Deluxe Reverb cabinet. I will aim the Shure SM57 microphone at the speaker cone and that um, relationship as far as angle, position, distance and all will remain absolutely constant throughout the evaluation. As you can see, this is a pretty well matched pair of tubes. They're within one milliamp of plate current of each other. So uh, I really think they're going to work well uh, for our project here. For our first sound evaluation, uh, we have about 10.3 milliamps at 467 plate volts. 
and when we multiply that out we get 4.81 watts which is right on the money for our 40 percent uh, plate dissipation setting. Let's see how it sounds. Alright, here we have an average of 13 milliamps and 462 plate volts. Let's see uh, what plate dissipation that multiplies out to. It's 6.01 watts, which is ideal for our 50% settings. Uh, let's see how that sounds. Alright, I've set it now to around 15.8 uh, milliamps and 454 volts. So let's see what plate dissipation that produces. Let's see, that's going to be 7.17 uh, watts and that's almost exactly uh, our target plate dissipation of 7.2. So let's see how it sounds at a 60% plate dissipation value. Now I've set it to 18.6 at 452 plate volts. Let's see what our plate dissipation is. And as you can see that comes out right on the money, 8.41 watts. So let's see how it sounds at this setting. Now I realize that each of those audio samples was uh, spaced out by the derivation of the bias information and recording it. So now to facilitate a side-by-side -side comparison of each of those audio samples, I will play them again for you in rapid succession uh, to make it easier to detect the differences.
now we're inside looking at the computer screen and seeing an audio editing program that shows the amplitude spectra of each of the four tunes that we recorded at 40, 50, 60, and 70 percent of maximum PD. This is the second set that I recorded off camera to see if it would duplicate our first set. And I believe you'd have to agree it does. You could pretty much just overlay these four over these four. And as I said, this agreement gives us uh, a lot of confidence that the data that we're looking at here is reliable. And what that data tells us is that amplitude of our signal, okay, the volume of our signal does in, indeed increase the higher or hotter we bias the output tubes. At 40% the output volume was minimal, at 70% it was maximum. In fact, you could take a straight edge and put it right along here and draw a straight line along the crests of each of this excessive sample. Now this is not subjective evaluation. Uh, there is no doubt that the uh, amplitude of our output signal is directly related to the uh, bias percentage. The higher the percentage, the greater the amplitude. But what is subjective is your opinion of the tone at 40%, 50%, 60%, and 70%. Now, I've tried not to inflict my opinion on you all, but I just can't resist saying that although these spectra cannot really reflect tone, they only reflect amplitude, it's as if they did, in my mind and from what I heard. Each successive increase in a bias percentage seemed to yield a uh, obvious increase in tonal quality. So I'm going to leave it at that. If you felt that the tone at 60% was just about as good as at 70% and you want to bias your tubes a little cooler to make them last longer, more power to you. Okay, like I said, this is uh, a personal choice that you can make. But I think we have accomplished uh, two of our three goals. Okay, we have uh, provided uh, data here that uh, can help us assess the tone at four different uh, bias levels. Also we can assess the relationship between amplitude of our output signal and the bias percentage. And now is the third and I think probably the trickiest of the criteria that we have to measure. And that is kind of an age-old question. Do we get more or less headroom when we bias hotter or if we bias cooler. Okay, I've heard it both ways. Some people say crank down the bias, you'll get a whole lot more headroom. Other people say, oh no, no, the tube works best at, in this case, 70% of a maximum PD and you will also get the most headroom there. Let's find out scientifically if uh, which of these two uh, theories is correct. Now the way we'll do this is I'm going to connect the output of the amplifier to an oscilloscope. I'm also going to connect it to a dummy load so that we don't harm our output transformer and also uh, since it's not connected to a speaker we won't have to listen to the god-awful noises that will be made during this evaluation. Then I'm going to input a 2 kilohertz and a 10 kilohertz steady signal into the amp. We'll go to the oscilloscope, we'll crank the volume up on the amplifier circuit, uh, and we'll uh, stop at the point at which distortion starts to appear in the waveform. Then we will use the oscilloscope to measure the output voltage from our amp that is associated with that very beginning of distortion. Now, if you have low headroom, the distortion will start at a relatively low output voltage. Whereas if you have a lot of headroom, or maximum headroom, the 
distortion will not occur until we have achieved a very high level of output voltage. Now the output voltage is directly related to the output power of the amplifier. So this is going to give us a really good handle on whether uh, biasing hot gives us more or less headroom than biasing cool. Now if that makes sense, and even if it doesn't, it will once you see it in action. Um, and if that sounds interesting to you, then let's go out in the workshop and get started. Alright, we're out in the workshop. Several things we need to discuss before we get started. Number one, this is the audio uh, frequency signal generator set at 20 times 100 or 2000 cycles per second. I put a AC voltmeter across the output and it is putting out exactly 0 0.1 volts of signal into the normal input of our uh, deluxe reverb amplifier. When I turn up the volume on the amp, we will see a waveform on the screen of the oscilloscope. Now the oscilloscope is set to a time uh, per division of 5 milliseconds. That's one two hundredth of a second. So whatever we see on the screen is going to be times two hundred. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten waveforms times two hundred. That is a two thousand cycle per second waveform, which is what we're going to start with. There are several types of distortion. Uh, to my knowledge, only two can be shown on an oscilloscope. Let me show you what they look like. Okay, I'm going to crank up the waveforms. I'm turning up the volume, and I want you to notice that sort of a shoulder has appeared right here at the x-axis, right at the center between the peak and trough of the waveforms. Now I'm going to turn it up a little higher, and that is crossover or notch distortion. What causes that is, as your push tube pushes, then your pull tube takes over, there is a tiny little lapse there. In this case, it's minimal. Okay, uh, sometimes you're going to see one waveform come down, go flat across, and then drop. That type of crossover distortion is to be avoided. It doesn't sound good. Okay, now I'm going to show you the second type of distortion that we can see with an oscilloscope. Now I think we've all heard the term clipping. We know that it's bad. It sounds lousy. Okay, it's not a good type of distortion. Let's see what it looks like. I'm going to crank the waveforms up. Watch at the top. Look what's happening. Doesn't it look like somebody took a knife or scissors and cut the top point off of the curve? Let me bring you the top point back. Okay, that is clipping. And it means then that the highest and lowest, it happens at the bottom end also, the highest and lowest output of the amp is being clipped. It's being, and believe me, it doesn't sound good. Now that's the type of distortion we're going to use to determine what the peak output is of our amplifier at each of the four bias settings. I will crank up the amplifier volume until we see clipping begin and then I will write down what the output voltage is of the amp into our dummy load. The reason I'm using a dummy load here is because if you have a speaker can you imagine what 2,000 cycles per second are going to sound like when I crank the volume way up on the amp? Not, not a good thing. Okay, so uh, we're using the dummy load. It will absorb the output from the output transformer and convert that power into heat uh, and dissipate it. This is a 100 uh, watt uh, dummy load. We have about a 25 watt amplifier. So we have a safety factor here of about four times over. You can see right over here that I have it set to 10 
volts per division. So if our curve can rise up to the second line here, that would equate to 20 volts. Now, oscilloscopes put out peak voltage. Uh, if you're not sure the difference between peak and RMS, check into my videos. I posted one that explains it. But the oscilloscope measures peak volts. The digital multimeter measures RMS voltage. To the ratio between them is peak voltage times 0 0.707 gives you RMS voltage. So if the curve reaches up here to the first line, which is 10 volts on the oscilloscope screen, that would equal 7.07 .07 volts over here. Now because reading curves off of an oscilloscope screen is really imprecise, I'm going to use the RMS voltage output from my digital multimeter to give us numerical data that we can use to show exactly what the RMS voltage output is of our amplifier when at each of the four bias settings it starts to exhibit clipping. Okay, if that makes sense, then let's get started. If not, let's get started anyway, because I think as you see it happen, it's going to start to make sense. Now you may recall that we achieved a 40% of maximum PD bias at 10.3 milliamps. So I have set the bias of the amp now at 10.3. Let's crank up the waveform, see when clipping begins, and then measure what the RMS voltage is coming from our amp at that point. Okay, I'll start cranking up the voltage with the volume control. Let's close in here. There it is. You see it start right there. It's kind of pointed right there. It starts to flatten. Okay, let's read. And that occurred at 11.7 RMS volts. Now we'll crank up our bias to 13.0 milliamps, which is our 50% of maximum bias level. Let's see when clipping occurs. Right there. right at that point. And our voltage level is 12.09 RMS volts AC. Crank the bias up to 15.8 uh, milliamps, which is our 60% level. Now let's see when the distortion begins. right there and let's see what our RMS voltage is and our voltage is 12.47 volts now we're set at 18.6 milliamps which is our 70 percent bias level Okay, there it is, right there. And our voltage reading is 12.75 volts. Now let's crank our frequency generator up to 100 times 100, which is 10,000 cycles per second. Then using the amplitude knob, I will adjust the output to exactly one-tenth of a volt just as it was at the 2000 cycle per second level. Now because we increased the frequency uh, at the uh, audio generator by five times from 2000 to 10,000 cycles per second, we now have five times as many waveforms. So to cut that down, let's go up to one 
millisecond per division. Now because there's 1,000 milliseconds in a second, we'll multiply the number of waveforms, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, times 1,000, and that is a 10,000 cycle per second tone. Okay, now we're going to repeat the whole procedure at 40, 50, 60, and 70 percent bias and see uh, where the clipping occurs and what is our uh, digital RMS voltage output. Okay, we're at 40 percent bias. There it is. That looks right to me right there. And our voltage reading is 11.61 volts. Now we're at 50 percent bias. I'd say it was right there, 11.94 volts, 60% bias with the 10,000 cycle tone. Looks like right there. And our voltage is 12.15, 70% bias. right there. And our voltage reading is 12.37. Okay, here is our data. Um, these are the readings at 2K and at 10K. This is the difference between them. It's around, it's 0 0.39, 0 0.38, 0 0.28. It steadily increases. And at 10K, it increases, but it does not seem to increase as much but still there is a steady increase. As you know, um, the amp uh, will respond differently to different frequencies, so this is not unexpected and this is also why I did two different frequencies. Now one thing that's nice is after we've done this and we know the peak output of the amplifier in uh, RMS volts, we can determine the output power uh, of our deluxe reverb amp. It's the volts, 12.75 squared, divided by the resistance of the dummy load, which was exactly 8 ohms. Okay, so uh, that's 162.56 divided by 8, or 20.32 watts RM. Some of you are probably thinking, well, I thought deluxe reverbs were good for like 24, 25 watts. And they are under proper conditions. Now, remember, this is a vintage pair of uh, tubes that I have in this, a 6V6s, they're both RCAs. I could put in a brand new set of uh, high output tubes and also don't forget that Fender biased really hot from the factory. I doubt seriously that they uh, obeyed the 70 percent rule back in the uh, early 70s. Okay, so I think they biased it hotter I think that the tubes were brand new, and I think that 24, 25 watts is probably a realistic value. But for our amp today, bias conservatively, this is what the RMS output is. I was reassembling the Deluxe Reverb after the completion of our project, and I saw something I haven't really noticed before. I was going to plug in the uh, cabinet speaker into the back of the chassis and look down here, total load 8 ohms, 20 watts RMS, which is exactly what we measured as the output of, from this circuit. Also in anticipation of uh, any questions, I did repeat the entire procedure uh, just to see if the second set of uh, readings would replicate the first set that you watched me acquire. And although the numbers were a bit different here and there, uh, the end result was almost identical. 
those were gathered with the uh, treble and bass set at their minimum setting of one. I then, just to make sure that the tone controls didn't influence the outcome, I ran the uh, procedure again at a, a bass and treble setting of 10 and got essentially the same results. So it appears that our data is uh, uh, believable, it's, it's reasonably accurate, and it is not affected by the position of the tone controls. While we have all this equipment set up, uh, I think it might be interesting to evaluate one other uh, question that arises from time to time uh, that has to do with a crossover distortion. Remember, that's the little shoulder that forms here between the waveforms. Ideally, this will be a straight line. Okay, but when we see this crossover distortion, there's two theories about why it happens. Number one, if the tubes are way out of balance, then when one tube ceases to function and the next one takes over, there'll be this brief lapse here in output. The second theory is that this occurs with extremely low bias. And what happens is there is no bias right here at this range if the idling bias is quite low. So when we come down here, we have no tube bias at all, and it drifts a bit before it takes up uh, on the uh, second output tube. Okay, so uh, we, with the setup we have here, we can easily evaluate which of these two uh, problems can actually cause crossover distortion. All right, I have a set of tubes in the amp, all warmed up and biased, and as you can see, there is some difference between the bias level of the two tubes, but they are up around the 70% level. So let's come over here to our scope and crank up the volume and see if we can detect a shoulder forming in the waveform before it starts to clip. And I think you have to agree, if there is a shoulder there, it is microscopic. Okay, it's almost impossible to detect it. Now these tubes are not perfectly matched, so I would think if tube matching were the cause of um, this crossover distortion, we would see a little of it here, but we don't. Now I've reduced the bias to an almost absurdly low level. It's down around 20% of max, okay, half of the lowest value that we evaluated. Now let's take a look at our waveforms, crank up the volume, and look at the shoulders. You see that? See the crossover distortion occurring? You can see very distinct little shoulders right there. So to me, there's no doubt about it, excessively low bias will lead to crossover distortion. Now it's time to discuss our findings. With regard to tone, it seems apparent from the audio samples that low bias does indeed produce rather poor tone, most likely due to the increase in crossover distortion. Recall the virtual absence of crossover distortion on the oscilloscope screen uh, with the 70% bias, but uh, once we lowered the bias percentage way down to like 20%, up to 40%, the uh, crossover distortion became much more evident. Thus, to avoid the fizzy, weak, lifeless sound of crossover distortion, we should bias warmer, say in the 60 to 70 percent range, rather than colder down in the 40 to 50 percent range. Now with regard to our second criteria, uh, which was gain and volume, we found that the increased bias percentage yielded an increase in both gain and volume. Okay, now these two terms are used interchangeably, uh, but are actually quite different. Let's stop for a second and discuss the difference between them. Now I've heard all sorts of conflicting and confusing explanations of the difference between gain and volume. We can define gain as the amplitude increase 
within the circuit. And the way you can calculate it is the amplitude output. This could be in volts divided by the amplitude input. Now let's go ahead and take the numbers from the experiment we just performed and calculate the gain of our amplifier. Remember that the amplitude input was carefully regulated at 0 0.1 volts. And the amplitude output at 70% uh, was 12.75 volts. That means that the overall gain then is 12.75 divided by 0 0.1 or 127.5 times. Now let's look at volume. Volume is the amplitude of the output signal. I believe once we grasp this simple example all of this will make really good sense and will stick with you. Say we have two amplifiers. Number one, we uh, put in a 50 decibel input. Now, input can be measured in volts, as we did with our experiment, or in decibels. Okay, either way, it's the strength of the input, the strength of the output. Uh, 50 decibel input, 100 decibel output. We see that amplitude output of 100 divided by the input of 50 gives us a gain for this amp of two times. Let's look at our second amplifier. 10 decibel input, but we get a 100 decibel output. 100 divided by 10 is the gain was 10 times. The second amp obviously has five times as much gain as the first amp, but look at the result when it comes to volume. The volume is the same. Okay, so <clears throat> gain and volume can vary independent of each other. Now with this distinction in mind, it's apparent that since the input amplitude was identical for all bias levels, remember we regulated it to be 0 0.1 volt input at each bias level, both the gain and the volume uh, were both directly related to the bias level. In other words, the higher the bias level, the higher the gain and volume. Therefore, hotter bias definitely produces an increase in both gain and volume. Which brings us to our final comparison, the onset of distortion, or as it is commonly called, headroom. The definition of headroom, as I understand it, is how high can the output power of the amp go before audible distortion occurs? In some amps, this distortion will occur at, say, uh, 5 volts of output. Uh, others might be able to go to 10. So the amp that can uh, go up to 10 output volts has more headroom than the amp that starts to break up at 5 volts. Now, to properly evaluate this is very tricky and would require some sophisticated equipment to measure, say, total harmonic distortion and things like that, that I don't possess. But we did see that the crossover distortion <clears throat> did not see, seem nearly as evident at the higher bias percentages. Also, when we look at the correlation between bias percentage and amp output wattage prior to clipping, and let's take a look at a table, we see that as the bias percentage of maximum PD increases, using the voltage readings that we got at each of these levels, I calculated the RMS output wattage of our amp prior to clipping, at 40% it was 17.11 watts, at 70% it goes all the way up 3.21 watts up to 20.32 watts. So there's no doubt that the output power of the amp does increase as the bias percentage increases. And since output uh, power is how we will define our headroom, you have more headroom at a hotter bias 
at least with regard to clipping distortion than we have at a lower percentage of bias. Now as I said earlier the main purpose of this uh, project was to present you with data to help you make up your own mind about what is the best bias level for your output tubes. Uh, I, I have been an advocate uh, fairly recently of more conservative bias, even down approaching 50 percent of maximum PD. And I must tell you that the result of this uh, project has sort of changed my thinking about that. Um, I'll tell you that I think maybe 60% is probably as low as you should go and 70% seems to pre uh, give you the maximum possible tone, uh, gain, and uh, headroom or freedom from clipping distortion. But like I said, at uh, 60% your tubes will last longer. So it's up to you. It's sort of a financial uh, decision versus um, a artistry decision, okay, as to do with the, the tone that you want from your amp. And I hope that the data in this experiment was collected and explained in a matter that is easy to comprehend and that you can use to successfully draw your own conclusions. If so, then it's been a great success. Uh, if you still have doubts or questions, why not watch it again and see if it doesn't make uh, them clear, the answers. Uh, and if not, uh, feel free to ask questions in the comments section. And now it's time to present our part two video. As a result of the very positive response I got uh, to the historical review of the development of the Princeton circuit, uh, as our part two video in the Tweed Princeton video that just preceded this one, I thought we'd uh, try something featuring the amp that we used in our experiment. And uh, so much is said about the relative merits of blackface and silverface uh, Fender amps. Let's take a look at the classic blackface deluxe reverb schematic and then compare it to the early, middle, and late silverface schematics. Let's see just how far uh, along, year-wise, Fender went before they really started to change the circuit or actually make it worse, in other words, uh, or if they ever did. Okay, so this would help you pick out uh, just how high you could go in the silver face deluxe reverb uh, lineup uh, and still get uh, what resembles or is identical to a blackface circuit. If that sounds interesting, then please stay tuned. Before we begin our deluxe reverb extravaganza, let's talk about one factor that actually elevates this way above simple curiosity. And that is the fact that there's a huge price difference between blackface and silverface deluxe reverb amps. I did a quick check on eBay for asking prices of both models and found that the uh, blackface uh, asking prices are up around $3,500 with one uh, brave individual asking over $8,000 for reasons unknown. Uh, whereas the Silverface uh, Deluxe Reverbs are less than half that, usually uh, around uh, fourteen dollars to $1,500. So if there is a way to get blackface tone at silver face prices, uh, this discussion may actually have a very significant point. Okay, so let's get started. First, we have to define what constitutes the classic blackface deluxe reverb circuit. During the period uh, from 1964 to 1967, Fender used three different circuits in their blackface deluxe reverbs. Let's discuss all three of them, see how they compare, and try to come up with sort of a composite that will characterize the classic blackface tone and circuit. The first circuit used in the blackface amps uh, by Fender uh, was the AA763. Now shortly thereafter, it mutated into the 
more common AB763. Most of us are, are more familiar with this particular circuit. But let's start off by taking a look at the uh, first version, the AA, and see how it differs from the more common AB763. The first difference is found in the tone stack. At the bottom uh, of both the uh, normal and vibrato tone stacks of the AA version, they use a 0.033 microfarad capacitor. Whereas on the AB version, they used a 0.047 microfarad cap. Now how this will affect tone is that with the higher capacitance value, the AB tone stack will allow more mid-range to exit from the circuit to ground. Whereas the AA version with the lower value capacitance will preserve more of the mid-range and send it on for amplification. Now if you are a fan of the traditional scooped tone that we find in Fender amps and you have an AB763 you're in good shape. Okay, you can leave it as is. But if you want to uh, add a little more mid-range to your tone uh, and you have an AB763 uh, circuit, you can go back and alter it to AA standards uh, by changing this uh, tone resistor in both normal and vibrato channels to 0.033. Now the second difference involves the reverb circuit. This resistor right here is critical in that it serves as the plate resistor for the reverb circuit. Notice its position right here. Now we have the input signal from the vibrato has come through the preamp and it has two ways to go. It can either go up here for further amplification as the dry signal or it can travel down here to the reverb tank and emerges as what we call the wet signal. Now depending on the value of this plate resistor right here, uh, if it's a high value, more of the signal will come down and become wet. If it's a lower value, like it is here in the AB763, less of the signal comes down to the tank, more of the dry signal goes through for final amplification. So on the AA circuit, the 4.7 meg plate resistor for the reverb circuit ensures that there is more reverb output than in the AB763 circuit which only uses a 3.3 mag plate resistor for the reverb circuit. Now if you have an AB763, and I do personally, uh, you could change the value of this resistor to gain even more reverb effect uh, if you think you need it. In my case I have more than enough. I can't see turning up the reverb intensity uh, past like about six or seven. Okay, so I don't need this modification, but if you do, that's how it's done. Now this, the third difference involves the phase inverter circuit. If we notice here on the AA 763, we have a 27K tail resistor and two matched 100K plate resistors. Whereas on the AB circuit, we have a lower 22K tail resistor and mismatched plate resistors, 82K on top, 100K on the bottom. Now here's why this uh, disparity is necessary. We're using two triodes for the phase inversion. In the upper triode, we input to the grid and the plate output is inverted. We use the cathode of the upper triode to drive the bottom triode and when you input to the cathode the output from the plate is not inverted. So we have inverted, non-inverted signals. In this system the output from the inverted 
triode will be greater than the output from the non-inverted triode. That's one of the shortcomings of this type of system. But the benefit of the long tail pair is it actually provides amplification as well as phase inversion. Now when they went from 27K down to 22K, they increased the current uh, flowing through the system and made the disparity between the uh, inverted and non-inverted outputs even greater. The inverted was much stronger than the non-inverted. So what they did was reduce the plate resistor for the inverted signal to bring it down to the same level as the un uninverted signal which has the same 100K plate resistor in both circuits. Now why, you may ask, does lowering the value of this resistor also lower the output signal from this triode? Well imagine that you're the signal exiting from the plate right here and you have two choices. Continue on to the grid of the 6V6 or take this shortcut to signal ground. The lower the plate resistor, the more signal will go to signal ground, less will go to the 6V6. Thus, by using a lower plate resistor here, we have balanced the output from our triodes in our long tail pair phase inverter. The fourth difference between the AA and AB circuits involves the tremolo circuit in each. And there's two changes. Look here at the AA, we'll see that we have a 56K bias resistor for the second triode. Whereas over here on the AB circuit, we have a 100K bias resistor. Now as you know, the higher the bias resistance, the lower the bias of the tube. So by uh, increasing this bias resistor value, we have lowered the output from this 12AX7 relative to the AA 12AX7 triode. The second difference is that the two grids are linked directly in the AA circuit, whereas in the AB circuit, the grid of the second triode is driven by the oscillation loop itself. Now what I think uh, has happened here is once you drive the grid from the oscillation circuit, the bias was a little too hot in the second triode to give the uh, best possible tremolo output. So they had to reduce the bias a little bit to maintain uh, the proper output for uh, the best possible sounding. The fifth and final small difference between the two circuits involves the addition of 1500 ohm grid stopper resistors in the AB circuit. They're missing in the AA circuit and to be honest there, it's really a, a step in the right direction to uh, eliminate parasitic oscillation and other problems. So uh, definitely even if you have a AA763 circuit you should add these grid stoppers. I think the bottom line is tone-wise the two circuits are virtually identical. The AA circuit might have a tiny bit more mid-range. Uh, it will have a, a wee bit more reverb effect but it probably won't need it. Uh, the long tail pair I think is probably better in the uh, AB763 and uh, with the compensation for the unbalanced output between the inverted and uninverted uh, outputs from the triodes. The AB is clearly better in the 1500 ohm um, grid stopper addition and as far as the tremolo goes I doubt that you could tell any difference uh, if you listen to them side by side. Now the third and final circuit that we'll discuss is the rather elusive AB868 uh, circuit which was found in the blackface deluxe reverbs made during the CBS era. Okay, the differences are extremely minor. These are rather uncommon. I've never worked on one. But uh, the differences, there's only three. Number one, they added 1200 picofarad 
capacitors to ground from each grid of the 6v6s. Now I think you can see that what this would do would be to filter out ultra high frequencies. If they exist on the grid they can take the 1200 picofarad uh, capacitor as a shortcut to ground. The end result is uh, theoretically you would get a little cleaner sound. Okay, so if your uh, deluxe reverb is not quite clean enough and you have the AA or AB763 circuits, you might add the 1200 picofarad uh, high frequency filters to your output tubes. The second difference is they increased the uh, filter capacitor in the bias voltage supply from 25 microfarads at 50 volts on the AB763 up to 50 microfarads at 70 volts. Once again this will make no difference in tone but this is a little uh, more filtration and may be a good idea. I know that whenever I uh, upgrade the, the capacitors in the BIOS filter supply I always go at least to a 50 volt rating. Okay, In this case they increased both the capacitance and the voltage uh, resistance. So this is not a bad modification and one that you might consider. The third difference however is a giant step in the wrong direction in my opinion. They went from a GZ34 on the AA and AB763 and they went to a to me vastly inferior 5U4 rectifier tube. Now there's several strikes against the 5U4 in my book. Number one, it has a directly heated cathode, which means that the minute you flip the on-off switch, high voltage will start banging into all your tubes, whereas on the GZ34 it has an indirectly heated cathode, which means that as you, after you turn on the uh, power, you'll get a very gradual ramping up of uh, current being output from the rectifier which will gently uh, power your tubes. So we have the slow startup here which is very uh, desirable and um, next uh, the 5U4 requires 3 amps uh, for its 5 volt filament supply whereas the GZ34 requires only 1.9 amps uh, of uh, filament supply voltage. So as you can see the GZ34 is a lot easier on the secondary uh, 5 volt winding of your power transformer and thirdly the GZ34 is much more efficient. You'll get a, an extra 20 to 25 plate volts with a GZ34 than you will with a 5U4. Now all I can think of to justify this is a, an economic benefit to 5U4 tubes. They must have found a stash of them at a, a cheaper price okay because there is absolutely no benefit to doing this okay it's like taking the V8 engine out of your car and putting in a 6 okay it just doesn't uh, it just doesn't benefit the circuit whatsoever so any of you that have the uh, AB868 circuit you might consider upgrading to the GZ34 rectifier okay the 5 v 4 will give you more sag a less attack lower plate voltage and no slow startup. Okay, if that appeals to you, and I'm not sure why it would, uh, then stick with your 5U4. But uh, if you really want the best possible rectification, I would say switch to a GZ34. Now, with all that said, I'm going to use the AB763 uh, circuit as the basis for comparison to the Silver Face amps. Okay, uh, it's the one that we most commonly see. It has uh, certain advantageous uh, benefits uh, and uh, it has a GZ34 rectifier. So this will be the circuit that we will use uh, when we uh, do comparisons with the other silver face circuits. Now that we've defined what the classic blackface deluxe reverb circuit looks like and it is the AB763 let's discuss the circuits that appear in the silver face versions of this amp. First off is the wonderful news that probably the majority of Silver Face Deluxe Reverbs have the AB763 circuit. So right off the bat, if you can find one, 
Uh, now the one in the video, my own, it has the AB763 circuit and it's from 1974. So although you may think that this would only be available like in the very early silver faces and then that they went on to other uh, circuits, such is not the case. A whole bunch of them were built with this blackface circuit. So I would say if you're looking for the ideal deluxe reverb in Silverface, uh, this would be the one to hunt down. And to be honest, they're not that uncommon. So you can get a uh, fabulous deal here, a Silverface for like tw uh, $1,250, $1,400 that has the $3,500 circuit within it. Okay, so that's the first wonderful revelation. Next, we'll look at the uh, circuit that immediately followed and actually coexisted with the AB763, and that is the A1172. Now, this would indicate that the change was made around 1972 uh, in November, so you would expect this to be in uh, 73, 74, and on Silverface Deluxe Reverbs. Now, I've circled all of the ways that the 1172 circuit differs from the AB763 that we accepted as sort of the uh, ultimate blackface deluxe reverb circuit. And we discussed a bunch of them already when we looked at that AB868 uh, blackface schematic, uh, which was, uh, remember, uh, it's an uncommon version, but rem we already discussed these. The uh, filters on the grids of the uh, two six uh, V6s, the increase here of the filtration for the uh, negative DC bias supply, uh, the use of the 5U4 rectifier, and um, yeah, I guess that's about it. Um, now, I've also marked changes here with stars that show the way that the 1172 differs from both the 868 and the AB763. So these are the ones we need to focus on. This, if you have an 1172 circuit, the stars show the ways in which your circuit differ from the both the AB763 and the AB868. Let's start down here on the reverb circuit. They've added a 2,000 picofarad capacitor to ground to uh, reduce the high frequencies in the reverb circuit. Uh, I imagine if you listened uh, to them side by side, there might be a very slight difference. But And if you wanted uh, to uh, make the blackface modifications to your 1172, I guess you could remove that capacitor. But it's really not doing any harm. Uh, this is a, a more significant change, really. They went on the coupling capacitor into the long tail pair. They uh, increased the uh, capacitance to 0.01 microfarad. Now, on the previous two versions, the blackface versions, this is 0.001. So, uh, on any coupling capacitor, when you increase the value, you're going to allow uh, low frequencies, more of them to pass. Okay, so this would give you a little more low frequency um, amplification uh, in your output signal. That may be desirable. It's up to you, but this is a difference between your 1172 and the classic blackface schematic. Secondly, they lowered the grid leak resistors in the long tail pair from one meg to 330K. Now doing this actually reduces the noise. The higher the grid leak resistance, the more tendency there is for some noise to be generated. So this will give you less noise, but it also lowers the input impedance for your signal, which means that more of your signal can go to ground than with the one meg um, grid leaks. So uh, I would guess that this is going to reduce the output um, the volume or the gain of the um, long tail pair uh, 
phase inverter a little bit. Okay, so uh, you may want to go in and change these back to one meg. It's up to you. We also discussed uh, the filters here on the grids. Not a bad idea. Uh, maybe better than the black face. You might want to leave them. Here's a significant change also, although it doesn't really do much, and that is they changed uh, on one of these nodal resistors from 10K down to 2.2K, but all the voltages remain the same downstream. I think what it does is it works with this filter cap to change some of the cutoff frequency of uh, what can pass. Maybe they felt this uh, gave you enhanced filtration or eliminated some undesirable frequencies. I doubt that you could tell on a side-by-side -side comparison whether you had a 10K resistor here or a 2.2K. I'll leave that change up to you. We also discussed here the uh, change in the filtration of the negative DC bias supply. Probably a good move. You might want to keep it. Okay, uh, and uh, one change they did make on the 1172, which is really foolish, is they moved the standby switch from after the reservoir caps in the blackface circuit to before the reservoir caps. Now all of you who have built uh, amps know darn well that this is not the hot setup here. This is not what you want. What you want when you flip your power on and your standby is is in standby, you want it after your reservoir caps so they can charge up. Okay. Otherwise, if it's before, when you close your standby there's a tremendous outrush of current from your rectifier to fill the reservoir capacitors and the filter caps. Having your standby before the reservoir caps then stresses your uh, rectifier tube. Having it after balances out that stress and makes it much less. This was a terrible idea. If you have an 1172 circuit and have the standby switch in this position, it would behoove you greatly to move it after the reservoir caps. Also, all of the silver face uh, circuits after the AB763, including that AB868, all use the inferior 5U4 rectifier tube. And I, it's got to be a CBS decision to reduce um, manufacturing costs. They must have gotten these cheaper. GZ34s are kind of a deluxe um, rectifier tube and are probably more expensive. This is a bad move. Uh, if you have an 1172 circuit, you really need to go back to the GZ34, move your uh, standby switch after your reservoir caps, and be sure you double check your bias on your 6v6s because you're going to get about 20 to 25 extra plate volts and that will change your bias. So we really need to go with a GZ34 here if you want to uh, get some of that blackface tone. Okay, now the, the final uh, change is something I don't fully understand. I'm just going to describe it to you and uh, I'll leave it up to you to try to figure out. Okay, here's the mystery. I checked the transformers on the Silverface non-AB763 uh, circuits and they're identical to the blackface which is great okay so when you uh, have an 1172 or the next schematic you have blackface transformers and what's mysterious is is using the same exact uh, power transformer both in silverface and blackface mysteriously the center tap on the 6 volt winding disappears on the 1172 and they use the virtual center tap. Now I don't understand how exactly the same transformer which is a uh, 125 P23B has a center tap when it's in a blackface uh, circuit but it doesn't have a center tap when it's a, in a silver face circuit. I don't know if maybe the center tap is present and they just taped it. If you have an 1172, check. But uh, the grounded center tap is better than the virtual center tap. If you've got the center tap, ground it and get rid of the virtual. If you don't have 
the center tap, then join me in wondering why you don't, because you have the Blackface Power Transformer. Okay, that does it for the 1172 circuit. As you can see, the differences are extremely minor, uh, and we pointed out what they are. Uh, an added capacitor, a changed coupling cap, changed uh, grid leak resistors, added uh, filter, uh, would amount to uh, filter uh, caps off of the grids of the 6V6s to eliminate very high frequencies, a changed nodal resistor which probably has no effect. This is bad and needs to be changed to after the reservoir caps. This is just fine and uh, this needs to be changed to a GZ34 and the mystery of the center tap needs to be resolved one way or the other. Now the third and final circuit that you could find in your uh, Silver Face Deluxe Reverb is the A1270. And once again I've circled all the ways it differs from the AB763 and we've already discussed all those differences now twice. So I'm going to leave that off. Now the only difference I can find between this and the uh, 1172 is they moved the standby switch after the reservoir caps instead of before. So if you have a 1270 you're one step ahead on converting it to a blackface in that your uh, standby switch is where God and Leo intended which is after the reservoir caps. I think moving it here was some sort of unintentional error which they quickly resolved. Okay, uh, all the same things we said about the 1172 apply to the 1270. Okay, conversion back to GZ34. The center tap mystery persists here in the 6 volt winding of the power transformer. Uh, negative DC power supply filtration that nodal resistor, uh, grid uh, capacitors to filter off ultra high frequencies, and uh, this uh, capacitor over here which would eliminate uh, high frequencies from the reverb. Okay, so uh, if you've got a 1270, you're in good shape. Listen to what I said uh, for the, about the 1172 and ignore the part about moving the standby switch. So that does it for this comparison of blackface and silverface circuits for the Fender Deluxe Reverb. We defined what we think is the classic blackface circuit and then uh, saw uh, the differences between this, the AB763, and the two other versions that exist in the silverface uh, Deluxe Reverb. We saw the differences were very minor. In some cases they might even be considered improvements. Uh, but uh, if you wish to convert your silver face circuit uh, into the 763 style, I showed you how. And in most cases, you won't need to change a thing because you already have the AB763 blackface circuit in your silver face deluxe reverb. So on that happy note, I'm going to bid you all farewell. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoy these uh, technical sort of second features. Uh, the first time I did this, uh, we got really good reviews. Uh, and I'm hoping we'll get the same for this. Okay, so let me know in the comment section if you'd like me to continue this type of second feature. And uh, no matter what, stay healthy uh, and stay tuned. We'll see you again in the near future. Bye for now.